Yeah. So hi, I'm Julia Coney, you guys. I am a wine journalist based in Washington, D.C. And right now I am talking with the fabulous Ms. Nicole Hitchcock of Jay Vineyards, who <laughs> makes one of my favorite sparklings ever from coming from California. Like, I just love this wine so much. I love the Pinot Noir, but the bubbles, honey, you, you do an amazing job. And you have a, an interesting background because before you were a winemaker, you were a psalm? I was not ever officially a psalm. Uh, however, I did work very closely with some, okay. with some psalms in, in several restaurants. Yeah. Okay. And Jay Vineyards is Sonoma Valley. So Sonoma County, right? Sonoma County, Russian River Valley. Russian River Valley. Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we're, we're located in, uh, in the town of Healdsburg, um, southern part of Healdsburg, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of the northern part of the Russian River Valley, AVA. Um, yeah, and surrounded by beautiful, beautiful countryside uh, vineyards, and um, it's, a, it's a gorgeous area. I need to, I was just there in March before the world shut down. Um, I was in, I went to visit a friend who just moved to Healdsburg. She lives by Big John. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so we went to some meat place for lunch and was hung out in Healdsburg and it's so adorable and everything like that. But I was just like, I need to come back out here and explore more of Russian River Valley because it's such a, it's so, it's so beautiful. It really is. And I mean, Healdsburg is a great town, amazing restaurants and, you know, just general culinary scene, um, you know, also tasting rooms throughout the town. Uh, but it's also kind of at the intersection of the Russian River Valley, Dry Creek Valley and uh, Alexander Valley. So. Mm -hmm. It's really kind of choose your own adventure um, if you want to go out tasting and exploring uh, and just seeing the sights and tasting the wines. When the world opens up, we're going to Sonoma. Yes. Yes. And yes. also it's just like, it's just re like California is pretty, but Sonoma is green too, in a way that is, it's still small, it has a small town feeling to me. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely. You, There's a lot of little small towns kind of dotted, dotted throughout the area. Um, and I think you just said it's really like green and lush. Yeah, I mean, we've got these beautiful redwood forests, um, you know, just amazing terrain. Uh, it's, I've even heard that, you know, the background on like the Microsoft, mm -hmm. the, you know, the green rolling hills, that was actually photographed in Sonoma County. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. Everyone yeah. knew that background. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so, yeah. Tell me a little cultural scene and um, oh, you know, yeah. lots of diversity, not only grapes, but, um, but lots of fruits and vegetables and things like that. The fruit out there. Oh my God. The fresh fruit. The, oh my God. Even at like a place like Big John's, which is considered a grocery store. I mean, you could just tell it's like, it just tastes better. Yes. That's yes. It. it just tastes better. Yep. That's so right. So you started in restaurants, huh? I sure did. I sure did. Yeah. I grew up um, on California born and raised. I grew up on the Central Coast in uh, the Carmel, Monterey area. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I worked in several restaurants from you know, smaller Italian trattorias to, to fine dining. Um, and that's where I first got interested in wine, right? So, I mean, everybody remembers their first, mm -hmm. their first job, um, you know, pouring wine for guests and things like that. And um, you know, at the beginning, I knew very, very little, mm -hmm. um, but everything I did learn made me thirsty to want to know more. Um, and then when it came time to go to college, I, uh, I decided to go to UC Davis and study viticulture and knowledge. So get the science um, and the agricultural perspective uh, on wine from there. So, um, so that's what got me into more onto the, the winemaking track rather than, um, than the song. Okay, okay. And you said, um, you mentioned the word Italy. Yes. You speak Italian, correct? I do. Because you did, a, you, you, you worked in Umbria? I sure did. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, so when I was in college, my, my minor was in Italian. And so, um, so I spent some time uh, living in uh, the area of Todi in Umbria mm -hmm. um, in an agriturismo. Um, but they had a working vineyard. Um, uh, a winery that was a, kind of about to get going. Uh, and so, yeah, so I lived and I worked there for, for a summer and it was amazing. I think um, that's when the culture of wine really outside mm -hmm. of what we know in the United States really started to hit home for me. Um, I realized how wine is absolutely an everyday part of, <laughs> of oh, yes. you know, people's lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the family that I lived with, I mean, we, we had wine with lunch. Um, we had wine with dinner, and this wasn't anything fancy. 
it was, um, you know, they bought it at the, they, they would get it at the co-op mm -hmm. or it was produced from the property. Um, and it was just, you know, everyday house wine, but it was such an integral a part of, um, of the meals and just the general day-to-day -day culture. You know who has a house in that area of Umbria now? Oh. Nancy Silverton. Oh, really? Yeah, on Chef's yeah. Table. I remember yeah. that name because I was just like, no one sure. knows. Like, that's like, like knows that. And uh, Nancy Silverton has a house there. Uh, it's, which is it's a very sweet part of the world. It, it really is. Do you ever get to go back? Like I've to that part? I've visited a couple times since okay. then. I mean, that was, oh gosh, it was more than 20 years ago. <laughs> um, but I've been back a couple times to, to visit. And um, yeah, I mean, I just love it. I could, I could return over and over again. Um, so, so do you think that bringing, cause I always feel like, like one thing about Italy, the, the in, in Europe, the culture of wine, it also like, it changes you in ways you don't really understand that later on all that influence has changed you as well. So that wine is like, yes, it's part of my life. I, yes, I make it, but it's still part of the lifestyle and the, you know, cause like you said, it's always a part of culture. It's a part of everything they do. Like everything is about the, also the meal coming yes. together in the community of what wine should and can be, you know? Awesome. And that's the thing, like when I always tell people, you know, and they're like, they're telling me to have a party or they wanted me to help them because I also work in wine retail. I'm like, you always got to have a bubble. Like you just, when people hear a bottle pop, it just makes everything better. That, yes. You have to have a bubble. I know you have to have it. And then we can go into the other things because I think we just, because I studied abroad in France and, okay. you know, I was not into wine like I am now, but I understood like wine is at lunch and wine is at dinner and no one kind of talked about coming home. I had a really bad day and there's all wine, but there's no food. <laughs> that, you know what I mean? Like, it was like, no, like there's wine and food and it's meant to go together. So, yeah. It really is. I mean, what I saw from, you know, from living there was that there was just this, just such an emphasis on both food and mm -hmm. wine. So, I mean, I felt like the days almost revolved around, you know, what are we going to have for, you know, for lunch and then what's <laughs> for dinner. And, um, you know, it, it was, it was my dream come true because I've always, you know, loved that aspect of, mm -hmm. uh, of wine is it's, you know, Wine is wonderful on its own, but it it can become so much more magical when you um, when you introduce food into the equation. And speaking of, so we have the J Cuvée, the twenty year, the Cuvée uh, twenty Brut that we're uh, drinking right now. So what I found fascinating with this wine is that you guys age it first for thirty months. That's right. A minimum in champagne for non-vintage is 15. Yes. So you did, you guys did twice. So can Double you that. Me, yes. why, what made you decide that? You know, there's with sparkling, I like to say there's no such thing as you, you can't, you can't rush time. Time mm -hmm. is what makes, uh, makes sparkling special. And so, you know, what happens with these wines when they're, when they're laid down on tourage is you get a gradual softening more creaminess in the mouthfeel, a little bit more kind of toasty, nutty character from, mm -hmm. from the autolysis of, of the yeast as it's broken down just very slowly over time. And you know, the difference between a wine that's aged for 15 months in the bottle versus 30 months is profound um, in my mind. And for the style that we're aiming for with the Cuvée 20, it is much more that round, toasty, creamy um, type of style. Uh, that I like to think is, you know, uh, closer to champagne. It is certainly a, a very, very, very unapologetically California in that <laughs> it's got incredible, nice, ripe, bright fruit um, mm -hmm. that to me screams, you know, California and some of the California sunshine. But it also has some of those cues that, um, that remind me of, um, of, you know, that extra complexity that comes with the, with the time entourage. Do you think because the ripeness of the fruit is so much sun in California that you're getting, you're getting a, a, a different characteristic just because of that? I don't know if it's just because of that. To be mm -hmm. honest, I think, it's, I think it's a couple things. I think that you know, when you taste sparkling wines from around the world, you know, irrespective of what region it is, um, they taste quite different. So they are, you know, there certainly is an element of them expressing uh, the place in which they're grown and made. 
And what I see uh, from, from our sparkling wines grown in the Russian River Valley is we get that nice ripe fruit because we do have the, the really nice sunshine um, during the daytime, but we do have really cool nights. We get, uh, the Russian River Valley is famous, as you know, uh, for the fog intrusion mm -hmm. comes in um, overnight from the San Francisco Bay and hangs out in the morning. So it keeps the acidity really nice and tight and bright. Um, but then we get that, you know, that beautiful fruit expression from, from the sunshine. But then I also think the soils are um, another mm -hmm. aspect that have a huge influence. Um, the soils in, you know, the chalk and champagne is quite different from, um, you know, a lot of the, the alluvial and, you know, some of the volcanic soil that we see in the Russian River Valley. Um, so that certainly has an impact. It's, you know, it's a little bit of all of these elements that I think um, just generates, a, you know, the style and the ter the um, style that's typical of a particular terroir. Okay, and I have a photo of a cocard press. Yes. So you, why, how, first of all, how did you guys get a cocard press? I mean, that's insane. <laughs> like, I am pulling it up because it is just fascinating to me. Like, I am just, I'm, I'm obsessed with this. Yeah, so I, so cocard press, just to fill everybody in, if you've never seen a cocard press, because it's, it's pretty atypical outside mm -hmm. of France, um, is it is rather than a membrane press where you have um, essentially a bag or a bladder that inflates and, and squeezes the grapes. Yep, there's a cocard press. And ours is, <laughs> ours is a little bit of a different uh, setup, so it's not okay. a round basket, but it, it, it fundamentally it's the same. Okay. So it's more like um, a couple of plates that squeeze together mm. um, and gently let the juice out of drainage channels. Um, but it's that much gentler than you would see for other types of presses. And this is the, a very traditional press that's used in champagne. So we imported not one, but two cocards to okay. Jay. Um, one of them was, um, was way back uh, when we were first going after um, sparkling winemaking. So it was, it was right at the very beginning. And then we liked what it did so much that we purchased another one a few, a few years later. Um, so, but our founder, Judy Jordan, you know, had mm -hmm. the vision. She wanted to craft world-class sparkling wine from Russian River Valley. And, um, and she knew that we needed the right tools to be able to do so, so. And those uh, are the right tools. I mean, to actually go and get something that's so traditional, right? Yeah. That a lot of places aren't, you know, they don't have. That's in the U.S. That's not something, you know, that you normally see on a, on a wine tour. No, in the States. no, not in the States. And not. definitely not if you're not in Champagne, you know. Yeah. Well, and they're important too, because especially with sparkling wine, where you have the effervescence and, you know, you have such a purity to it, mm -hmm. any type of roughness or astringency or, you know, faulty mouthfeel is really going to be exacerbated with all of the bubbles, um, ultimately. So the, the better you can do, the more gentle you can be up front with pressing, mm -hmm. the better the outcome. So... For me, when I taste this, I taste like I'm, well, first on the nose, I'm getting this beautiful, like, um, preserved lemon. That lemon, but not like fresh lemon. Like it's not that fresh quality, but it's that pres like a preserved lemon, yeah. especially like preserved Meyer lemons. Sure. That actually, to me, just, it screams like sunshine. <laughs> That's what it does. It just screams sunshine. Yes. So I also had this before. I paired this with a salad. Mm -hmm. I paired a salad with some feta, just like greens, feta, black pepper, salt, olive oil, nothing too fancy. And actually, um, the olive oil was a lemon-based olive oil. Delicious. That was somewhere I got in, at the grocery store in California. It was like a Meyer lemon olive oil. And it just brought out everything in this wine. It's so well-made and so well-balanced because I always try to tell people, like, it's Everyone wants to do sparkling, but everybody can't always do it well, no matter where right. you are in the world. Like, it, ju it just happens. But you guys have, like, really, like, done a very good job in everything. So for this one, the uh, Cuvée Brut, like, what do you pair this with? Like, when you drink this, what do you drink this with? Yeah, so um, I'll talk about what I had for dinner last night because it, um, it was perfect and we actually had some Cuvée 20 on hand and just might have <laughs> popped a bottle. Um, but it was a, it was a black cod with a, with a white miso sauce um, and I grilled it on, on the barbecue. So it had kind of a, there was kind of a caramelized 
a little bit like of a roasted note to it, but also some sweetness from, you know, from the miso and then the, the butteriness and just, you know, the black cod just kind of melted in your mouth. Um, and the cuvee 20 was a perfect pairing for it because there is a little bit of that, you know, a little bit of a toasty character mm -hmm. as well, some hazelnut um, and some, some, you know, some elements that I thought went really nicely with that, that caramelization. Now I have a quick question. Like you said, white miso. I have a thing of white miso in my refrigerator. Yes. How much miso do I need to make this like cod? Like, is it like a tablespoon? Like, oh, yeah. it okay. was it's not a lot. It's Did you like lot. whisk it and put soy sauce? Oh, and so, okay. Some lemon. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so there's actually some Meyer lemon in that as well. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, this is so good. Oh my goodness. Well, and this is, so it's, it's, a, it's a blend of Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. It's yes. about 54% Chard, 43% uh, Pinot Noir, and then the balance is Meunier. What made you decide to do the classics? Because the reason I say this, most people outside of France do not do Meunier. Yes. We, <laughs> we actually at Jay have a very traditional approach to, to our sparkling winemaking, and we mm -hmm. have since the very beginning. Um, so we've always, uh, that we've always, focused on those three classic uh, champagne varieties um, for the for the makeup. So, um, you know, at this point, you know, that's what our vineyards are planted to. Uh, we've got access to some great Meunier um, that's, you know, just right down the road from us. Okay. Uh, so, and we think it just makes the, the best, most classic blend. It does, it balances it out. But that's what I would say most, you know, mo you don't really get a lot of the Meunier. People are like, you know, they know Chardonnay and they know Pinot Noir pretty much, but when you hear Meunier, in America, I'm, I was like, oh, like this is really fascinating. No wonder I like it because it also lends something different and it makes it interesting. Absolutely. You know, it makes it interesting to drink, interesting to taste, and interesting to smell. And it's sure. also just very pretty. I, I, hate, I, I like, hate to use that word, but it's just a very pretty bubble that I think to me, this is one of the reasons why I'm always like, people ask me like, oh, do you drink sparkling from California? And I was like, Jay Vineyards. And they were like, ha ha, like is your initial. I'm like, no, I get that. But <laughs> it really is like great sparkling. So since we talk about sparkling, do you all make a rose as well? Uh, we sure of, do. Of sparkling? Okay. Yeah, we, so people, we, is, we you know, is, if, if people keep asking, is it rose season? I'm like, it's rose season all year long. All so, year. So I have to ask that for, so when I put this video, when people ask me like, I'm like, yes. Yes. Yeah, we, um, our, our portfolio of sparkling actually includes 12 different sparklings, um, you know, including a couple different magnums. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we've got, you know, we've got a vintage Brut Rosé, we've got a non-vintage Brut Rosé, uh, Blanc de Noir, we'll be releasing a Blanc de Blanc this fall. Um, we've got vintage fruit we've got a, a late disgorged which spends mm -hmm. seven years or longer wow uh, on the lees so um so yeah the scope and the, the breadth i think mm -hmm. of our portfolio is um it's pretty pretty interesting because you don't you don't see a lot of that um especially in california um the scope of the sparklings that we mm -hmm. make and then also balanced with our still wine portfolio oh and we, which is a great segue into the pinot noir if yes. we do, like, go into like you know and also, this is my thing, like, about, I, I have a joke with my friend who is trying to get me down the rabbit hole of Pinot Noir, specifically Russian River Valley Pinot Noir. Yep. And I was like, it's so interesting and different, and it changes in the glass. It is elegant. And I've had this one open, like, it, it is really nice. <laughs> like, and, and also, because you use a lot of clones. Yes. Like, I saw, like, you have the... But one of my favorite one is the six six seven. Uh huh. Sure. I went down a rabbit hole of six six seven uh, clones and uh, for Pinot Noir two years ago, and I was like, anything that if they if I can find that it's a six six seven, I'm like, okay, this is why I like this one. Yes. 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 Yeah. We have a we have a huge emphasis. I mean, we've got a a lot of different clones that we work with. Some Dijon clones, some more heritage clones. But what we think that brings out in the final wine is just, I mean, complexity. You can taste um, different clones from a particular vineyard site, mm -hmm. and they all taste unique and very different and bring something to the table. Um, but they all have this underlying element of that particular vineyard site. Um, I mean, I think, I think site does trump clone, uh, mm -hmm. clone in, in most circumstances. Um, but what the clones bring is just, you know, extra diversity and uh, opportunities for us to, to blend. 
Now, when you, you also worked in Australia. That's right. So when you worked in Australia, what kind of, were you working with Pinot Noir there or were you more doing like the GSMs? So I was actually in Western Australia. So, um, so a little bit, you know, de definitely different than some of the, um, you know, the South Australia regions that people, people might be more aware of. So I was just outside of Margaret River. Um, yeah, we did a lot of, we did some Bordeaux varieties. So Cab, Merlot, obviously a lot of Shiraz. Um, some Semillon, Chardonnay, Sauv Blanc. So, mm -hmm. um, so it was quite a variety. There wasn't a whole lot of Pinot Noir planter, planted in uh, Western Australia, although there is a little small little region called Franklin River um, that was just south of us that actually produced some pretty outstanding Pinots. I was impressed. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, because I, I saw that. So because the juxtaposition of Italy and Australia, I was like very curious because there was Italy. Yes. And then there's Australia, but in the middle you did wine sales? I, you know, I did two years um, early on in my career doing sales, yes. So um, working um, more retail types of accounts initially, and then I moved more to on-premise and, um, and hotels and restaurants. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it was great. I think it's the hardest job in the world. <laughs> People think winemaking is hard. Um, I thought sales was, it was, let's just say it was character building. Um, and I have a huge appreciation for, you know, for those who, who excel at it today. That is, that's amazing because you, <laughs> what I love about that is that you have varied aspects of the business that a lot of winemakers don't really have. They just, you know, they know winemaking. They don't really understand the set. They understand sales, but they've never had to sell it in that kind of way outside of maybe visiting with a sales rep but you're right uh, i have friends who are in sales for wine and you know it they're like whoo like someday and because i work in retail i see the sales reps i'm always like yes. i'm like here for you 100 percent. i can't do anything because i understand what this is happening so that that's amazing but i love that that you have this well-rounded background and then yeah. you went to davis Right. And then, so, yeah, so then I, I was at Davis, um, you know, for four years where I got my undergrad. Um, and then, um, and then I worked around California, really, in large wineries, medium size, um, smaller wineries, uh, until I came up to Sonoma County in 2010. Um, and I joined Jay in 2015. So I've been, I've been here for a little over five years, coming up on my uh, sixth harvest. Um, oh, and it's a dream come true. <laughs> oh, wow. How's it looking? Like, did you guys just have bud break? Um, we had bud break. It was really um, mid-February. So, um, so it's been a couple months. It, you know, you'd be surprised if you came out here. The vines are growing quickly. We've had some um, incredibly just nice, warm weather, fairly mm -hmm. temperate, you know, 70, call it 70s, um, and then just touching into the 80s. But the shoots are growing fast, and we're, we're really well into the growing season at this point. So when do you think Verizon will happen? Um, I'm thinking it'll probably be beginning of Jul beginning to mid July, mm -hmm. which is pretty typical. We're right now in this vintage 20, we're on pace more or less with average. Okay. Uh, bud break came early, but then we had some cool weather and now things have warmed up. So I think that I think that the growing season is going to accelerate, but um, it's looking like a pretty typical year in terms of timing. Okay. And in a normal year, we start harvest with our sparkling uh, as well as our Pinot Gris uh, at the very beginning of August. So, oh, uh, okay. you know, the first, actually, my first vintage, we started uh, last day of July. Oh, wow. So yeah. how long is your harvest usually? Six weeks? Four weeks? Six weeks? Ooh, it's a little bit longer than that. Uh, we, <laughs> we usually start up right around beginning of August and finish in uh, early to mid-October. Oh, wow. Yeah. Sometimes, if we're lucky, we'll end at the end of <laughs> September, but, but usually it, it draws out into October. So that's all, what is it, 10 to 12 weeks? Technically, almost some, sometimes? Usually ends up being about 10, 10, 11 weeks, yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, the season unfolds like this. We start with sparkling and Pinot Gris, and then we, we usually start bringing in our Pinot towards the end of August or very beginning of September. Mm -hmm. And that goes for another, you know, actually, most of the duration of the rest of harvest. And then Chardonnay actually um, finish, finishes us off. Um, the area is so cool for Chardonnay that it just hangs on to its acidity. Um, and 
you know, it just gets that, just needs that extra ripening time. Yeah, I think the Russian River Valley Chardonnays remind me of Burgundy mm. a lot. Like, it just because it's such a cool climate and everything. And, but it's just fascinating because how many, well, which, which ones are destemmed? Well, I want to say you don't destem, you destem for the sparkling, correct? But you don't for the Pinot Noir. Or do I have that backwards? Backwards. So we okay. do not destem for anything that's white, anything that goes into the okay. presses. Um, you know, it's all handpicked into small bins and then goes into the presses full with the stems. And what that helps do is just, it's, it's a pressing agent. It mm -hmm. helps the juice drain out. Um, for our Pinot Noir, we destem nearly 100% of the time. Occasionally, if there is a... Uh, you know, block that comes in that um, where you've got nice, ripe, lignified um, racuses where we think that the, it would add something to the wine, mm -hmm. we will not destem. But um, generally, all of the Pinot is, is destemmed. Okay. Yes. Is, is that just more, what about, um, is that be a preference? Do you notice that that change with, is that always or does it change year, year to year? Um, it is, it's more of a house style. Okay. So it, it doesn't, it, it, we're opportunistic about when there's a great <laughs> opportunity to, um, to either add stems back because that's something else you can do. You can de-stem mm -hmm. and then add stems back or you can just not, um, not de-stem at all and go whole cluster direct to, to the fermentation tank. And it's just, you know, it's up to the condition of the fruit. We wouldn't want to do it in a year where we had really green, green stems or in a year where there was any issues uh, with, you know, with the fruit composition. Mm -hmm. um, but in a nice year where things are, are ripe, um, it's, you know, it can be a, a nice tool okay. to provide extra structure and, and some spicy notes to the wine. Okay. So that brings us to the 2017. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, oh, this is so, I love, I, I have this thing. I used to write about beauty, but my my preference for beauty was really like the chemical parts of fragrance component. I'm a fragrance person. So not having, so since I can't wear a fragrance, I have to like drink wine that smells like fragrance. <laughs> and so my whole thing is wine as fragrance. That's a big thing for me is wine as fragrance because I love those notes that you would normally get in a, in a traditional fragrance when it's made well that I also bring over to wine. And so that's the one thing that when I was smelling this, I was like, Oh my God, it smelled to me. Initially, when I first put my nose in, I was like, hmm, it smells like violets, right? But now it's smelling like dehydrated violets, which uh -huh. a lot of people have probably never dehydrated a violet. <laughs> so, but it just softened. Absolutely. Yeah. It, yeah. It. <sighs> well, what I love about this wine is, um, is that it is primarily sourced from our estate, six estate vineyards that uh, are across Sonoma mm -hmm. County, or sorry, yeah, Sonoma County, Sonoma Coast, okay. mainly Rush River Valley. And then we've got, uh, we've got one property that is up on the far Sonoma Coast. And if you know the Russian River, you'll know that it's really, really diverse. It's a large yeah. region and it's pretty diverse in terms of the different microclimates throughout. And so for this wine, we get fruit from some of the very much cooler vineyards that are in the southern part of the AVA, where there's a lot more like savory characteristics, mm -hmm. there's leather, there's more earth, there's some mushroom. And then as you move more north, you get riper characteristics from the Pinot. Um, so more of the more of the fruit expression, you get some more floral notes that I think, you know, you just called mm -hmm. out violets, roses, sometimes lavender. Um, and, and so with this wine, this is actually a blend of close to a hundred different small lots of Pinot that we're all wow. separately and barreled down separately. Um, and that all have their own unique contribution to the blend. Why so many? Why, 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 why? I'm just curious, why so many? Yeah. No, so the way that we are, that our cellar is set up at the winery is really ideal. For, uh, for small lots of Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to visit the vineyards and determine what section I want to bring and what I want to keep separate, right? So let's say I've got, you know, a sublock at our Bowtie Vineyard of the Clone 667. I can, I can identify what I think is the best part of that sublock, bring mm -hmm. it in separate and ferment it on its own, and then bring the rest in and ferment that on its own. 
um, because I think that ultimately they're going to have different qualities. Mm -hmm. Our fermenter tanks uh, range from one ton to 10 tons. So oh, we okay. are able to keep everything separate. And just by the nature of the, those sizes, at the end of the year, we net out with close to 100 different lots of Pinot. Yeah, but, but that's amazing that you actually can keep them separate. Yes. But that's a lot of like... That's a lot of moving parts. If you think of like, and I mean, you do it all the time, but that's, a, that, that's what makes this so interesting is because it, it will, it's one of those, like you keep putting your nose in and it's like opening and changing and. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you know, when I say a hundred different lots, we're talking a couple barrels of this, three mm -hmm. barrels of that, four barrels of this. So um, it's small quantities that, you know, that get put together and I hope kind of come into harmony um, after they get blended. Oh so. yeah. It's and this is, we fun. use for, for our Pinot Noir and for our, for our still Chardonnay, it's, it's a hundred percent French oak tight grain barrels, um, that I think contribute a really interesting kind of spicy characteristic, but also structure. They're not terribly high impact. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the idea there is to add oak in a subtle way that doesn't mask the fruit, but instead really supports it. Um, and just gives it that extra element of texture and uh, and spice. Yeah, and that's the thing is, and also it has a, it has a, a beautiful softness, and the softness yeah. actually rounds it out. Yes, yes. Yeah, someone uh, just said that's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. It's and not always easy to manage. Uh, you know, when you've got that many different lots of wine that, you know, to try to maintain them and keep them healthy and keep them, you know, um, expressive and, um, and then put them all together into something, into something that comes out like this. So there's a lot of work, um, not just by me, but, but our entire team here at Jay, and we're really proud of what we do. Nice. Well, I will send some photos. Yes. Yes. So cool. I am starting with the East Side Knoll. Sure. Okay. So I'm going to, you guys, share my screen because Nicole sent over some photos for me uh, to actually share so we can see. So I had to, I numbered them, so. Oh, good. Yeah, so this is east side, right? Yes. So what is planted here? So this is, this is Pinot Noir. Mm -hmm. um, the first three photos that you're going to show are all, uh, are, are three of our six estate vineyards. Okay. And the first side, the first one is East Side Knoll, mm -hmm. which was the first vineyard uh, that, that Jay acquired um, after really going into business. Um, okay. And it's a beautiful site with just kind of undulating, rolling hills. This is Pinot Noir. This particular clone is, is 115. Uh, these vines were planted in the late 90s. Um, and so, so you know, 195? 115. 115, sorry. Yep. Okay. Um, so, you know, so they're, they're nice, mature vines. Uh, but this is one of the classic uh, estate vineyards that, that Jay's been farming for, for years and years. Um, and, you know, is, it, it holds a, a special place within our portfolio. And so um, it's hand harvested. All hand harvested, yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So we, 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 we solely hand harvest um, everything for our Pinot. So everything that's in this okay. glass is hand harvested. Amazing. And Ariel of this one. Yes. Bowtie. So tell me about Bowtie. This is, um, this property is uh, about 40 acres total, um, planted to both Pinot and Chard. So okay. right now what we see is we're facing west, and um, the, the portion that's closest to us is all Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, but then as you move kind of up on the hill and towards, yep, towards that road, it's, uh, it's all Pinot Noir. There's nine different clones of, of Pinot um, planted. And uh, this, this is the northernmost vineyard that we, that we farm in the Russian River Valley. Okay. Um, so this is usually, this kicks off Pinot harvest for us, um, but it's a, it's a crucial part of what's in this glass, what's in this Russian River Valley Pinot glass. Um, and we also make a single vineyard designate wine off of this, off of this property. How many it, acres is this, roughly? I mean, it's 40 total. So it's about 40, okay. 15 Chard and about 25 Pinot. And as you can see by the name, 
there, it's roughly shaped like a bow tie. It is. That's why it's so amazing. <laughs> I love it. Like, here's the middle. That's one side. Like, yeah. yeah that's right. I, I love that. I love that. Okay. So bef- let's see. We have Annapolis Ridge that is yes. coming up next. Oh, okay. look at that. Oh, I, it makes me happy. And it also makes me sad that I'm not like literally running through that. <laughs> Well, I, I get photo oh. credit for this one. The, the other two were taken by professional photographers. But, okay. uh, but the Annapolis picture uh, I took this last season, uh, oh. it's the most spectacularly beautiful property up on the far Sonoma coast. Uh, it's only about seven miles inland from the Pacific as the crow flies. And, um, and it, is just, it is just beautiful. Uh, it's planted entirely to Pinot Noir, um, mostly Dijon clones, and um, this is actually Sonoma Coast AVA. It does not fall within Russian River. It's Sonoma Coast. Okay. Um, and the fruit off of Annapolis is so different from anything that that we farm in the Russian River Valley. It's it's got this dark fruit character with um, you know with big tannins, big acid, and just brilliant color. Um, and we use about 15% of it in this Russian River Valley blend just okay. to give it some extra depth. Okay. That is, that photo is gorgeous though. <laughs> Thank you. And then we have the sorting. This is the part that like, I'm like, I tell people like vote with your dollars. Yes. You do when you have a glass of wine because we need this because of this. Yes. So this is, this is um, this last harvest, and uh, we had a group of people all sorting the fruit. So all of the Pinot that we bring in, I mentioned, is hand-picked. Uh, but we, um, we also, we sort through it just to pull out any leaves, any raisins, anything that we wouldn't want going into the fermentation tank. Um, and so, you know, this is, part of our, this is part of our daily rhythm at the winery. And you can see the, the gentleman with the pink hair there, uh, <laughs> yes. KJ. He's our assistant winemaker. Um, this was the week after our annual pink party. Um, our, our tasting room and visitor center puts on a pink party every August. And you know we dye the fountain pink, all the lighting's pink, everybody wears pink. It's a big rosé type of thing. And obviously KJ uh, decided to celebrate by um, coloring his hair as well. That's so much fun. Kimberly, uh, I've my, my friend Kimberly is on here. Kimberly, we need to go there and dye our hair pink. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> absolutely yeah. right let's go to this part this is the kind of party i want to know i want to oh, go to. it's the best party of the year there's dancing into the you know into the night and uh, last. okay um what's teardrop teardrop is the winery or the winery the vineyard that is right out in front of the winery um, mm-hmm. and it's really kind of a clonal demonstration vineyard so i actually don't know the, the number of clones that are out there it's something like maybe 20 different clones and a mm-hmm. lot that nobody's ever heard of. Um, <laughs> and it's meant to just be kind of a demonstration of you walk mm-hmm. out there and you see the different, um, you know, the different sizes of the clusters, the different shapes of the berries. Um, some are more high yielding, some are lower. Um, so you really see what clones actually do with Pinot Noir. And this was this last harvest. Um, on the right-hand side, you see Andrew Rogers. He's our vineyard manager. Mm-hmm. Um, and then on the left is Victoria Gaeta, and she's our associate winemaker. Um, and so we had a team pick. I yeah. love it. I love and we it. Ended up making a, a, an experimental sparkling um, uh, with the fruit. Um, mm-hmm. We did some carbonic maceration. And uh, yeah, we did some creative things with it. It won't be sold commercially, but it was a lot of fun. Nice. And this lovely last photo that I received, like, what is this? Where is this and where can I eat in here? <laughs> this is our bubble room. So I talked a lot about, you know, the back of the house and the winemaking, which is, you know, the crux of it. Kimberly and I are like, ah, oh, it's a bubble room. Like, oh. We have uh, an incredible culinary program at J. Um, and this is kind of the culmination of it. Uh, this is our bubble room. It was really the first of its kind in the area. And um, you see that this is a newly renovated room mm-hmm. as of about three, four years ago. Um, but essentially it is uh, a six course, five course food and wine pairing experience, usually with some extras uh, and all paired with our tasting room exclusive wines. The menu changes every six weeks. Um, and it's 
seasonally driven. Uh, we have an emphasis on local sourcing um, with all of the great uh, produce and, and things that you can get from our area. Um, and it is absolutely an experience not, not, to, not to miss. So it's you were, so there's a separate wines for the tasting room? I, did I catch something? That you yeah, so okay. we produce a, nearly 30 different wines mm -hmm. at Jay. Um, so you're tasting two of them, only two of them today. Mm -hmm. uh, 12 Sparkling, 10 Pinot, we do Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Gris, and a Rosé. Um, and the majority of those 30 wines are only sold through our tasting room and wine club. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so for that, uh, people will make a reservation, like when they want to go visit, to do this particular uh, tasting. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, so yeah, reservations for this are encouraged. Of course, we're not uh, operating right now with the oh, current course. conditions, yeah. um, but we hope to reopen as soon as possible. And uh, reservations are recommended. Um, we have a couple other tasting experiences as as well. So. You know, you don't have to come to the winery and do a mm -hmm. two to three hour sit down uh, affair. Oh, but why not? <laughs> just, That's a great question. <laughs> like, you're a wine country. Like, why not? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That 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 gave us a lot. Like, so yeah. Um, somebody said, "Oh yeah, we we got the winery. Everybody follow." So yes. So I am going to unmute everybody. So if you have any questions, I know I'm assuming Jeremy, who's on here, probably has a few questions. So, so yes. So Jeremy, you have a winemaker on the phone. Yes, I'm calling you out. I know. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So Man, I think I, I was the one who said it was so impressive about how you had the hundred different, you know, Pinot Noirs in one wine. What made you decide to, to go that route? It's, you know, it's merely um, the fact that we don't have big tanks. We've got a lot of small tanks which I consider an advantage in the fact that we can keep things separate and it gives us room for blending later. Um, and when I talked about that, we, you know, we make uh, 10 different Pinot Noirs. So this is only one of them. We also do a lot of vineyard designate Pinot Noir. So we do one from the East Side Knoll, Bowtie, Annapolis, et cetera. And those are really where that comes in handy when you've got a lot of little lots, maybe a couple barrels a pop, uh, to be able to look at multiple different options to put together spectacular interpretations of, of the Pinot that can come from those specific sites. I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. Working with Pinot Noir is, uh, especially in Russian River Valley, is, uh, it's really incredible because the grape is so transparent to where it's grown that you see so many different personalities expressed depending on where the vineyard is. And, you know, when I say Russian River Valley is a large AVA, yes, it's, it's large-ish, but you still have very different characteristics and personalities of Pinot that come from properties that are just, you know, half a mile apart. Um, and it's because of those small little microclimate differences, the soils, um, the clonal selection, all of the above. But it's, um, it's really fun to work with. That's great. Thank you. That yeah. is one of the reasons I always tell people like at, at its core winemaking is agriculture and it doesn't stop like because everything's on a holiday, right? Because you're, 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 you're dealing with like climate, the universe saying, okay, this is going on, but you people still have to work because wine is still an essential business because it's still a farm. And I, you know, is, is making, having people understand that is one of the things like I love bringing these kind of conversations to have people meet people in the industry, meet the winemakers to understand where your wine comes from. Like that is the thing, where it comes from is also to tasting wines that have a sense of place, a sense of character that you're not getting if, you know, I can't see, like I can look at a photo and like they're sorting grapes, right? I know someone can tell me 
this vineyard, this vine, and everything that, you know, this year was great. Last year, maybe not so much, or different things like that. So thank you so much, Nicole, like for bringing that out and, and having us have this. Also, women winemakers, let's talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> like hats off to you, women winemakers. Like that is like, I mean, you know, it's this business, it's, it's hard, man, but, it is. but for women winemakers, you know, we think about how many graduate from like Davis, place like Davis, but actually how many have winemaking jobs? Sure. So we ever, you know, we don't, we don't, we have to move that conversation to that as well. Absolutely. And I, it's, you know, the situation's gotten a whole lot better, um, you know, versus when I first started in the industry, but I still think, I still think we have a, a ways to go. Mm -hmm. um, but you do see more female winemakers working their way up through the ranks, which is, uh, which is really exciting. Yeah. And which I, which I am just honored to like, write about and talk about and bring people on. So I just want to know if anybody has anything for Nicole, let me know. I'm finally keeping these on time. I'm like trying to get like 3.45 to 4 o'clock, like, like my one hour that I'm trying to promise people. So um, I probably, Kim, I'm going to call you out because yes, we're going to talk about, uh, Kim is like my bubble sister. <laughs> so, but she lives like, you're in Sag Harbor or Hampton? Yeah, I'm well, I'm hunkered down in Sag Harbor. Yeah, East End. We gotta figure out how to get this J Vineyards to you. Like okay. I gotta work on this getting this for you. Cause I this is your type of wine. You know, it's interesting. I've had I haven't had any recently, but over the years I've always it's been my domestic go to. Mm -hmm. I love bubbles and I, I had no idea about the winemaking process. I am super impressed and just really excited about what i just heard and it's yeah it's crazy and the manure like who like you were saying julia like no one no one in california is doing manure I, no. I mean no one no one that i know like so I, and i know like who's doing it and that was like no wonder i like this no wonder i have a magnum of this yeah. <laughs> now this all makes sense yeah that i'm yeah. still saving for when the world opens up sure yeah. Well, a fun fact on the Meunier, we uh, we're just releasing right now our 2016 Blanc de Noir, and it is 40% Pinot Meunier. Wow. Yeah, wow. which is the most we've we've put in any of our sparkling, but it's That's gorgeous. Now, speaking of, since you mentioned that, are you guys considering a Brut Natur? We have a trend, so that's why I'm asking. Projects. Okay, that's why I'm like auctions and things like okay. that. We do not do a Brut Natur, but we do do an um, extra Brut style okay. so it's got about four grams per liter dosage um so it's certainly on the more bracing and drier side um but so far we have not done um you know a brute zero or anything. yeah but but the but the, the cuvee 20 doesn't drink like a 10 um 10 dosage wine it drinks to me a little lower than mm -hmm. that when i was reading the, um the the scriptures and the notes and everything it drinks a little less like not it's not necessarily dry but I would have thought the dosage would be higher than 10. Sure, sure. Yeah, we, we you know, when we do dosage, um, we set up dosage trials in advance of the disgorgement. So um, it's, it's me, my winemaking team, um, our cellar master, um, sometimes our chef comes in as well. Mm. Um, so we've got a group that all has kind of different um, viewpoints on, on what the dosage should be. And we'll set up trials, we'll dose, um, multiple bottles with different levels of dosage or different dosage makeup. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes include something like brandy or, um, you know, or just varying amounts, right? And we'll taste them all blind and come up with a selection of what we think is the most balanced wine. So for something that's in the brute category, we absolutely want it to, you know, be bright. We want the acidity to shine. We don't want any type of dosage or residual sugar to stand out. So it's all about finding that balance, no matter what that dosage level is. So yeah, it's, this is 10 and a half grams, um, but the idea here is to um, ensure that it's, it's balanced and doesn't lean too far either way. Okay, okay, perfect. Thank you so much. It's, it's lovely. It's lovely like, to meet you because I've been drinking your wines. <laughs> like, like I'm just like, I'm like fangirling over here. I am like so happy right now. I'm like on cloud nine because to me, when everything happens like this as a wine journalist, 
it was like, how do I pivot to bring the wines to people in a different way? Because I'm not traveling, but how can we take them into the vineyard? And thank you for the photos because it helps to actually put the sense of place and the wines and we can see it and we know eventually things will open up. And then how, where are we going next? You know, how can we get help? Not just like now, but in the future and to understand that. And my year 2020 is like really promoting a lot of women in wine. That's what I'm trying to do. Well, thank you for that. Cause we need more of that. <laughs> we, we, yeah, that's all, that's all I got. Like I'm just yes. trying to tell people, I'm, my job is to sell wine. I am to, here to push wine. I am here to sell it. That is like my goal in life is, and that's what I'd like to do because I want to also not just sell it, but sell it wine that is made with a purpose that is made from a heart that is, you know, is big, you know, everything big doesn't mean bad. You know, sometimes people like, if you do a big volume, it must not be good. That doesn't necessarily mean that, but this is a wine made with quality. The price point is good because I want to say the J. Cuvée is like $38. Like that is really a, del a great price that everybody can rally around and get in and understand. And it also tastes good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's <laughs> it tastes good. Intense. So yes. But I like what you said about, about, you know, promoting wines with a purpose. Um, and I think the other aspect of that is, um, is giving people, um, a better understanding of what it is all about. I, mm -hmm. I think the sparkling wine world can be very confusing for people. They get what a champagne is, they get a sparkling wine as, you know, as the effervescence, but you know, the protocol behind it is fascinating. Um, but I also think, you know, how it pairs with food, how the different styles, if you're talking about an extra brute versus a brute versus a demi sec, how do they, how do they all mm -hmm. compare? Um, I think some of these things are confusing for people and the more that we can educate and, you know, give people the information to help them better understand the more that they're going to gravitate, gravitate sure. to it. Exactly. So like, I don't have cod. At, I was just really, I was thinking, I've been thinking about that dish. So I have flounder. So yes. I'm going to make that dish and drink and have the rest of the bubbles with that flounder tonight. That's like my, that's going to be my meal. Uh, during the holidays, so um, the bubble room, which I, I showed you a picture oh. of, we have a, our, our chef does uh, an annual all sparkling menu, which is really cool. <laughs> and talk about a great education for people, but also a really fun experience. Um, you know, it's, it's multiple different sparkling wines, all paired with foods that, you know, you might be surprised um, could work out, um, you know, ribeye steak with our late disgorge what wait um, what like i am like what yeah. and, and, rib and, 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 i mean because you, you the crazy thing because when you think of pairings and bubbles it is never red meat the right. most you might go to is duck you might you would go into duck but it's never red meat our chef takes the pairings in directions that you would never expect but that absolutely work and are i mean they're cons consistent revelations for me. Um, you know, I've, I've had some big aha moments uh, in working with him. He's, he's fantastic. That is, that is amazing. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that. That is, that, that, like, I'm still trying to like, ribeye, late discourse. I, I get it theoretically. I can see it, but I'm trying to figure out that how that pairing would happen. I'm not I know it's great because that's what I'm chefs do. Like, I'm not a chef, so I get it. I know they're working their magic to make that happen, but I'm still going ribeye, you know? Okay. But yeah, that, that's amazing. Yeah. When the world opens up, I'm coming to that. Yeah. We're all, people are in like the chat, like, Oh my God, like what? Like, <laughs> that's very crazy. Yes. So thank you so much, Nicole, for taking the time out. I just want to tell you, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I know is, you know, everybody's still working. Nothing has changed. I try to tell people like these chats are fun, but we're all still working. And you, you know, winemaking is one of my the favorite things I love reading about, but I don't have to do. I've done a harvest and I know how hard that is. I'm like, yes. yeah. So, uh, but thank you for taking the time out of your day to like taste with me and taste with everyone and, and talk about Jay Vineyards. Thank you. Thanks no, for thank you. Me. Thank you so much. Like, I really appreciate it. So 